Greetings. I'm Bishop Chester Wright. I'm the Maryland, D.C. District Superintendent. And this uh, video session is one of the sessions I've been teaching on uh, explaining and trying to expound upon the elements of the Maryland, D.C. District Growth Plan that we believe that God has given us. This session actually will be a continuation of the last session, and uh, I do want you to understand that it is connected, I would hope, and asking that you would uh, watch the last session first, if you have not watched it yet, before you watch this. The last session was entitled, uh, The uh, Cycle of Learning. And so I'm picking up where I left off in that uh, subject, and I want to talk to you uh, in this session uh, about the ministry of impartation, which has a spiritual element to it stri strictly in praying for people. But that's exactly what true anointed biblical teaching is. It is a ministry of impartation. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8, Jesus said, And as you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. So this is one of the most fundamental and never to be overstated principles in the kingdom of God. That it's the foundational principle of the kingdom. Freely you have received, freely give. Anyone who has freely received from the Father will also be given a desire to freely give to others what has so freely been, been given to them. If I don't have any desire to give to others freely, I'm actually demonstrating that I have not freely received. I must give out air to take in the next breath. It's the cycle of life. There has to be an outflow for there to be an inflow. And since the word breath and spirit are actually the same in both the Hebrew and the Greek, that's, that's this cycle. So if God is speaking to me, and, and Paul said it, I believe it was in... Uh, in first, Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 11, and I'm reading from here. Paul said, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I have believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. There it is again. If I have received the rhema of God and believe it, that rhema of God compels me to speak that rhema. And that is the spirit of faith. That's the cycle of faith. That is also the spirit of ministry. And it's not enough to just proclaim what has been imparted to me. The Holy Ghost works in me to want to impart that to others. Not just proclaim it, but to share the understanding of it and teach how to do it and help guide people doing it so they can do it just as well as me. Someone asked me years ago, what will you do if your sons outdo you, whatever that means? And I looked them straight in the eye and said, I will feel like a success. Because the point is, all that I've learned comes into my life. I spent my lifetime learning it. But if they're willing to receive what I've learned by experience into their knowledge base, then they can build on that knowledge base with their own experiences. And what they know will be more than I know. Because they've received the benefit of what I've learned. And if they receive that and embrace that, then they can go and learn something that I haven't had the opportunity to learn. Because I've only had so much time in my life to learn. So again, if I freely receive, I want to give. If I'm not wanting to freely give, then I may be just a convert to a religion or a church service attendee. But I'm not a true disciple yet, because a true disciple is both a receiver and a giver. The Lord desires 
to give us more and more as long as he can trust us to not take ownership of it and keep it. That's why I've talked many times about the difference between being a vessel, a container, and being a conduit. As a container, I only can have a limited amount of God. As a conduit, I can have an unlimited amount of God. Because with a conduit, what is freely coming in is freely going out. Paul longed to see the Roman believers, he said. Romans 1.11, for I long to see you. For what purpose? That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established. In other words, I long to come to you so that I can give you what I've received. And what's my, what do I get out of it? To see you established. His expectation was that they in turn might impart to others. This, is, this ministry of giving to others what they had received would further strengthen and establish them in the faith. So when I receive something and then I give it, I get established and strengthened by giving it. Holding on to it, not so much. Essentially not at all. So... The Amplified says it this way, Romans 1.11. For I'm yearning to see you that I may impart and share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen and establish you. The word impart means to give over or share. The word gift, oh, what a word. This is the Greek word charisma. It's the word normally translated spiritual or a spiritual gift. But what is charisma? The root word here is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S in the English equivalent letters of the Greek. In almost every place, not all, but almost every place, that Greek word is translated grace. The suffix M-A at the end of a Greek word means the results of. So rema is the, sub, the results of reo. Reo is the utterance of the living voice. Rema is what the living voice has spoken. So, charis is grace. A spiritual gift is charisma, which is the results of grace. So if it's God's grace doing it, I can't ever take the credit for it. I can't ever take the, the ownership of it. It's not mine, and I'm not doing it, so look at me, put my name in lights, I've got this gift. No. Yes, it's imparted to me. And yes, I'm now accountable for it. But the problem is, it never was mine. It will never be mine. I'm only a steward, and I'm going to be held accountable for it. Paul wanted to impart some spiritual things to them. A spiritual gift, and I don't believe this means just one of the nine or twelve spiritual gifts, however you count but a spiritual gift of revelation, of understanding, of empowerment would be a, an impartation. Several spiritual gifts in their individual ministries and also the revelation of the body and the diversity of its members and their purposes, their individual contributions to the body are found itemized in 1 Corinthians 12. Now I know we go to 1 Corinthians 14 Read about the individual gifts. But that's not the only place in 1 Corinthians that talks about the gifts. So I'm reading 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. And listen to where Paul starts with this discussion of these gifts. Now ye are the body of Christ. Excuse me, I misspoke. The individual itemized gifts aren't in 1 Corinthians 14. They're in the beginning part of 1 Corinthians 12. But here in summarizing his teaching. In 1 Corinthians 12, here's how he introduces that summarization. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. In other words, every one of us has a different place in the body. Each one of us is equipped so that we can fulfill our place in the body. That's God's plan. <coughs> I don't have two eyes. I have a left and a right eye. They don't function the same. They function exactly the opposite so that I have clear eyesight. I don't have two hands. 
I have a right hand and a left hand. They are not the same. They look similar, but they're not the same. I don't have two, two feet. I got one right foot, one left foot. I don't have two ears. I got a right ear and a left ear. And if you look really close, you can see that this left one is higher than the right one. Because they do their own thing, apparently. And this left one, he, it lays back against my head and the right one sticks out a little bit. So my two ears are demonstrating to you they are not the same. They're similar in principle, but they're not the same individually. And so it is with every one of us in the body of Christ. I've heard this for years from guys. Oh, I want so-and-so's mantle of ministry. Not me. I don't want somebody else's mantle of ministry. I want whatever mantle of ministry God's provided for me. Oh, what about Elijah and Elisha? <laughs> I know Elisha got Elijah's mantle, but Poor old Elijah must not have used his very well because what God did through Elijah was significantly different. And it wasn't just a double portion of Elijah's mantle that made the difference between Elijah that went from up, went up and was always up and down, up and down, up and down. One minute he's standing facing the entire 450 prophets of Baal and the next he's running from a woman. But not Elisha. Whole city surrounded, the whole armies of Syria is there looking for him. And his servant says, Oh, Lord, Master, look, we're surrounded. And Elisha just says, Father, open the young man's eyes and let him see. And when he saw, he said, Okay, the city surrounded by the army of men, but the hills all around that army of men is filled with the angels of God. So those that are surrounding us are surrounded. Not exactly the same, is it? Not exactly the same. Now, you can desire somebody else's ministry, but I never desired either one of my sons to have my ministry because I believe with all of my heart that God gave each one of them their own ministry. And my responsibility as their father and their pastor and now their bishop is to help them and help facilitate them finding and knowing and doing the will of God and becoming what they're supposed to be. So this is where Paul starts this whole discussion. Now, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God had set some in the church, first apostles and secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, and then gifts of healing and helps and governments, diversities of tongues. And he asked this question, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? Have all the, the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. That's the implied answer to all of this. He says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And what was that? 1 Corinthians 14, 11. Paul, uh, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. In other words, get your motive right. Follow after charity and desire the gifts that God wants you to have to fulfill your ministry and not somebody else's. I'm uniquely made as a part of the body of Christ and so are you. You're supposed to receive what God has for you and he doesn't give it all at one time. And I make full proof of that ministry, of that gifting, so that I can reach the place that I'm now fully complete in preparation to be able to fulfill the divine purposes of God for my life and ministry. God's no respecter of persons. He's willing to do that with you too. Here's what uh, Thayer says about the word gifts, charisma. Grace or gifts denoting extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the church of Christ, the reception of which is due to the power of divine grace operating on their souls by the Holy Ghost. Oh, there's something else I wanted to mention here. Ephesians 4.11 says God gave some of the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In this list, 
he leaves out two of those five. Which two does he leave out? The two that we are most involved in being. He leaves them out. <laughs> Completely leaves them out of this list. Now, I'm not saying they're not important. That's not the point. But if that's all we're focused on is either being an evangelist or a pastor, where do we fit in here? So this coveting and earnestly the best gift. What is the best gift? The best gift for me is the one that God has planned for me. And me for me, for my ministry, for me to fulfill his plan and his purpose through his grace in my life. Note, it is important again to consider the root word of gifts is grace. I've went through, gone through that. I won't repeat it again, but it is true. Charisma is the results of grace. And when the gifts operate, they are grace in action. And who gets the credit for these great charisma? The God of grace who's operating them in and through us. If we receive gifts, then we're supposed to minister to others by the grace of God to work in and through us. In concluding this chapter, Paul unites both of the main subjects in 1 Corinthians 12. By demonstrating the contribution of the specific giftings of each member and the importance of those contributions to the benefit of the whole. In the context of this whole document and of this section specifically, it is very important to note that Paul included three of the five ministerial giftings that he listed in Ephesians 4.11 here. In the above, and equated them from a gifting perspective with other gifts of the Spirit. Many would consider, that's the reason we say they're not in existence today, apostle and prophet, being the greatest of all the gifts. He put them in a list with speaking in tongues, equated them all as spiritual gifts. That's why I've taken a position and will further later in this document that those five giftings in Ephesians 4.11, according to this verse, are gifts. They're not ministries, they're giftings of ministry. I don't become that. But those ministry giftings operate in that manner through me. I'm just the conduit. The Lord is the apostle. If, he, if, I, if I am, he's the prophet. If I am, he's the evangelist. If I am, he is the pastor. If I am, he is the teacher. If I am. Because he's the one that's doing the work. I'm just the conduit. It is of most important note that while these ministerial giftings serve a different purpose than the other gifts listed here that he discussed earlier in this chapter as every gift does they function similarly in that they are all operated by the spirit of the lord speaking to us the rhema of god that's why those gifts are mentioned earlier as the word of wisdom the word of knowledge prophecy is a word it's a word of faith that operates the gift of faith well, that's exactly how all of those fivefold ministry giftings operate. We hear a rhema from God and we speak that rhema. That's why they're all called giftings, because they all operate the same. The Spirit of God speaking to us a rhema of God, which is a logos from the Word of God, quickened either in either literally or in principle to our spirit, and then that same spirit of God, which is operating, which is called grace, empowers me to speak the rhema that I'm given. And depending on what the purpose and the normal way that God uses that function through me, it can be called apostleship or prophethood, if there's such a thing, or being an evangelist or pastor or gift of tongues or interpretation or all everything in between because it all operates the same way that's why we go back to again to second corinthians 4 13 this is the spirit of faith i've received or i've heard and therefore i've spoken i hear rhema i speak rhema that's why for me i don't really care what it's called let somebody else worry about the label all i'm interested in is the operation the function of it let somebody else figure out what, the na what name to call it. All I want to do is go wherever I'm sent, and when I get there, 
I want to hear what God's saying and speak it, which I call flow. I want to go and flow. And when the flow stops, I want to go home. Pretty simple, isn't it? And what is flow? Flow is simply the unrestricted by flesh, hearing the word of God and speaking the word of God, hearing the word of God and doing the word of God. Jesus said, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, he does. What he hears the father say, he says. Paul further explained this whole procedure in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 9. This is so beautiful. For I am the, the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Listen now. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Here you go. Ready? But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I labored, but it wasn't me laboring. It was the grace of God that was bestowed upon me that's now operating in and through me. That's how all this has happened. Now, I ask you a question this. Is God a respecter of persons? No. No, he's not. And if this same Paul said, follow me or imitate me as I imitate Christ, is this not the way we're all supposed to minister? Is not this the New Testament apostolic ministry that we're all supposed to strive for right here? If I'm not a prophet, I don't want to be T.W. Barnes. If I'm not an apostle, I don't want to be Billy Cole. I don't want to be any of those men. I want to be what God's called me to be. But I don't need to worry about what that's called. Let man worry about what it's called. I just want the grace of God that I've received so undeservedly to work in me and to not be frustrated. I don't want the grace of God to be frustrated. Galatians 2.21. I want to labor, but I don't want it to be me laboring. I want it to be God laboring by his grace in and through me. Jesus' name. So when men of God who are themselves fully equipped and trained, fully equipped and trained others in doing the work of their ministry, what is the result? It enables God to grow the church. Men of God who are themselves fully equipped and trained must in turn fully equip and train the saints to do the work of their ministry which in turn enables God to grow the church. The following text is a long one. And despite the length, though, it is most interesting that the translators made it one single very long sentence that is six verses long. Please keep in mind as you read the reference below that everything in this sentence is interrelated, independent, like it would be in any sentence. Nothing in that sentence is independent or it would be a separate sentence. While we are often guilty of focusing just upon individual portions of this sentence because we focus on specific verses, which are just parts of the sentence, if we're to fully and accurately understand all of the parts Unified as the Holy Ghost and Paul intended, they must always be considered collectively in the context of the whole. So here it is. And King James is just a little bit hard to follow, quite frankly. So here's from the King James, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the full equipping, full, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto, the, unto a perfect man, a full-grown, mature man, under the measure of the stature, the maturity is the Greek there, of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children 
those in need of milk, according to Ephesians 5 and 12, who are not yet teachers because we haven't grown up, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speak the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. I want to share something with you. This is important. What I'm about to do is, from my own study, from my own understanding, put Ephesians 4, 11 in words that I understand and maybe you'll understand too. It is really important for you to understand that what I'm about to share with you is not a translation. It's not even intended to be a paraphrase. It is what, if you would permit me to call it, an exegetical exposition. So here it is. This is not a translation or a paraphrase. It is just a simple, straightforward explanation of what I understand Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 to be. The Holy Ghost is saying through the Apostle Paul that God has given spiritual ministry giftings to those whom he has chosen. God has then given those gifted ministers to the church for the purpose of teaching slash training and fully equipping the saints to become able to do the work of the ministry of saints so that the body can grow both spiritually and numerically. These gifted ministries speaking with one voice will by the Holy Ghost bring both unity and a depth of spiritual maturity to the body that will, as a result of the process, rise to the standard of spiritual maturity set by the Son of God, the man Christ Jesus, our example. As spiritual adults and not spiritual babes, the depth and degree of this spiritual maturity will bring an immunity to the body against the lies and deceptions of Satan and his human minions. As we speak truthfully, individually, and as a body, because of our love for all the truth and for each other in Christ, we will continue to grow up fully in all those things which the Father has provided to the body in Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Operating in Christ as the source, all, or, excuse me, originating in Christ as the source. All of this will cause us to be closely joined together as a body, even unto us reaching a place of unity that we've never had before. This will be accomplished because every member of the body, in and through the joints of the body, the relationships between members, will supply the conduit of a unified body for God's strength to enable us to reach this place in him. The grand result of all of this, the body will grow both numerically and spiritually as we work and love together. Now again, that's not a translation. But from this, my study of various translations and also of the Greek words, that's what it says to me. And how, how absolutely awesome it would be for us all to grow to that place. How awesome would it be? Now, would God throw something out there he's not possible, he, he's not capable of doing? I mean, let's just take one verse out of another place. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away, or all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. <laughs> Is that completely fulfilled in your life? Next month I will have had the Holy Ghost 61 years. It's not completely fulfilled in mine yet either. But it's something the Lord is working in my life, heart, soul, mind, and spirit every day to bring me to that place. And so 
Do I believe God's able to get me to the place? Because I'm in Christ, because I was baptized into Christ, and Christ was baptized into me, that I'm able to get to the place that old things are going to be completely passed away and everything's going to be new? Yes, because he's God and he's able to do that. And he wouldn't set up a, 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 a mark for him to reach in my life if he's not able to get me there. And that same exact mark from a body perspective and its mission in the earth perspective is described in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. It sounds impossible, and it is. It's impossible for us to do. We can't do it. We can't get there ourselves. We can't produce this ourselves. But he is capable of producing that in us and through us if we believe it and if we let it and let him. Now, it's going to be happening every day. Little by little, here, there, little. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, degree by degree, moment by moment, minute, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. God is working on me in this life and bring me to that place. I've said it many times, and I believe with all of my heart, there are two wombs in our natural lives. There's the womb in our mother, of our mother, where our physical nature is developed. But this 70 odd years, give or take 69 plus or minus, the purpose of this womb is to develop all that character, the character of Christ in us, to give us knowledge and understanding and wisdom and develop talents and skills and all of that, why? Because this is not life. This is all developing for the eternal plan and purpose of God. And he's preparing all of us here and now to be a part of that. And if I'm not participating in that, pres that uh, uh, preparation, then what eventually happens? You know, the word abortion has not always been a horrible term. It's been a tragic term, but not a horrible term. My wife lost our first baby of, through no fault of her, home, her own when he was about five and a half, six months old. The doctors called that miscarriage a spontaneous abortion. Her body aborted that baby. Man didn't involve himself with it. And the giver of life has the right to take that life before it's born. He has the right. Nobody else does. Nobody else has that. And those that are in the body, in the womb of this process, they've come through that first natural womb, and then they've come through the womb of salvation, and now we're in a second womb. Is there another womb? Oh, yeah, Paul said. I travail in birth again for you till Christ be formed in you. The first spiritual womb gets me out of the world into the church. The second spiritual womb gets me out of myself, out of my flesh, and into alignment with God and his kingdom. But i got to participate with that. And if I only come out of that first spiritual womb and I just become a part of the body, but I don't participate, cooperate, then at some point along the line, God, who's the only one that has the right to do it, will trigger a spontaneous abortion, a tragic miscarriage of those who were given the opportunity to know him and to grow and rejected it because they just didn't, it just didn't matter to them. Didn't matter to them. In the earlier teaching in these series, we talked about chaff and wheat, that which comes out of the field in the, as a part of the sheaves. And that stalk and branches and leaves were all necessary and all a product of the good seed when it grew in the fields to produce so that the wheat would have a place to grow. And then when it was cut down and bound together as a means to transport the wheat to the threshing floor. But the moment that sheaf lands on the threshing floor, that which was needed and necessary and all just as much a part of the good seed 
as the wheat was, became unnecessary and not just unnecessary, it became negative because at that moment, it ceased to be a part of the process, the good part of the process. Now it becomes in the way, it's the chaff. And the whole period of time, and it's not an instantaneous process, it's a period of time where the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, and the testing of God with the winnowing of throwing things up in the, in our, up in the air in our lives, and then the sifting that we go through personally, all is intended to reveal, am I godly or am I ungodly? Am I one of his or am I chaff? How does, this, how does this reveal? By training and by a person's response to teaching and training and equipping and to the call of God that would prepare us and send us out in doing what God would want us to do. The focal point of this power-packed sentence, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, is the ministers imparting to the saints. With all this being said, the focal point and catalyst of all of it it's whether or not the ministry is going to fulfill their part in fully equipping the saints and then overseeing them going forth, doing their ministry so the church can grow. Again, the purpose and the result of their impartation of teaching, equipment, and training, again, said again, again, was for, their, for the full equipping of the saints to be able to do the work of their ministry which will result in the church growing and increasing. No impartation to the saints from the ministry, no growing church. If the ministry's focused on building a crowd and not imparting to the saints, the growth that happens will not be of God. Now, in summarizing this part, Here's a very heavy portion of this. You say heavier than what we've talked about? In some ways, yeah. 2 Timothy 2, 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. Look at the cycle of learning here and understand the purpose of it. At the direction of the Holy Ghost, the next step in this process of teaching, equipping, and training as a cycle is to choose from among the taught those who can be trusted to faithfully communicate the truth of the teachings to others, those who can also be trusted to teach what has been entrusted to them. So then this is the guarantee of the continuance of truth. Teach the trustworthy and then command that that they teach trustworthy, that they may teach the next wave of Holy Ghost inspired and empowered teachers. One more time, the guarantee of the continuance of truth is to teach the trustworthy and then command them to teach those that they consider trustworthy so that those can now teach the next wave. So it's a constant cycle. Well, here's a failure. Moses taught Joshua. And Israel, through Moses, came out of the wilderness. I uh, came out of Egypt into the wilderness. Through the ministry of Moses and Joshua, they made it through the wilderness. But then transition took place, and Joshua led them into the promised land. And Joshua trained Joshua trained whom? Name the man Joshua trained to be the leader to continue this cycle. Didn't do it. What's the result of that? Within one generation after the death of Joshua, One after that, one complete generation after the death of Joshua, there, the next generation, there arose a generation 
that knew not God. All because Joshua did not continue the cycle that Moses began. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Now we know from Numbers 11 who Moses' teacher was. His father-in-law. He spent 40 years with him out in the wilderness. He had spent the first 80 years of his life, excuse me, he spent the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's house. He spent the next 40 years of his life with Jethro, taking care of Jethro's sheep. That wasn't all that was happening. Jethro was a prophet of God. And we know that relationship because after Moses left Jethro's house and left his children and wives behind, or wife behind, and he went down to Egypt to deliver the people of God. After they came across the Red Sea, Jethro comes bringing Moses' wife and children. And he gives Moses some very strong instructions there. That couldn't have been the first time that Jethro taught Moses. So we know Moses' teacher. And we know who Moses taught. But we don't know who Joshua taught. But we know the results of him not teaching. There arose a generation, do not God. How sad, my friends, have we seen this happen over and over again. Pastors who preach to their people and maybe do some nice little Bible study in midweek. But they don't teach, they don't train, and therefore they don't trust and so people get saved among them and God calls them to preach. But the pastor becomes very distrusting of them because he sees them as competition. And he hasn't trained them, has developed a relationship with them. And they, he, he doubts they're submitted to him. And so he has to force them to leave to protect himself and his income. And what's the result? The man gets older. The ministry gets feeble because the vessel that it's being ministered through gets feeble. And eventually, how many great churches have died the death because their Joshua did not teach. Their Joshua did not find a Joshua to do what Moses had done to them time and time again. In my lifetime alone have I seen this happen. Churches that at one point were great churches, but they just missed this whole point because of the insecurity and the fear of the preacher. And why was that preacher afraid? Because he did not invest himself in training. Oh, he preached, and maybe he counseled. And oh, counseling, that's the end all to be all, isn't it? I can't really find it in the Bible, not the way we do it. Teaching, training, equipping so that we can trust is an investment. And it's not a short one. And it's not a cheap one. It's not. It's expensive. But it's God's plan. It's God's purpose. So my friends, and I hope we're still friends, I pray in Jesus' name that the grace of God has spoken to your heart, quickened you, given you some direction. And I pray that you have the grace to obey God and do what he has given you to do. And that by his grace, you'll present yourself before him for him to guide you and direct you through the processes necessary to see your church become fully all that God wants it to be. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this blessing upon you. Amen.